Um, but, you know, can one apply uh, a similar sort of sifting of the evidence in the East Midlands? Now, traditionally, a lot of people put the origins of towns down to, you know, this John Cleese lookalike wearing a leather miniskirt. Um, they credit the army uh, coming in and people um, wanting to serve the army with food, clothing, services, uh, and they can be a range of services. Um, but it's quite possible that that may have led to certain small accumulations or gatherings of people, but not necessarily the setup that you see in the broader landscape. One of the things I did before this was to look at the distribution, the spacing between the various settlements. And what you can see is a fairly consistent distance between uh, settlements in both Northampshire and Leicestershire of sort of 10 to 15 miles. Now that spacing is, is, is you know, fairly good. Um, and I think there's a logic to it. It's not because the military spread themselves thinly on the ground at this regular spacing. Now, there is a tendency, and there was back in the 1970s, I still remember uh, a lot of effort where people took central place theory and crystal and hexagons and looked at Roman settlement. As you'll see by that, probably not. Uh, the East Midlands, let alone England, is not an isotropic plane. Um, so whilst things may appear nice and regular and even, it's likely that there is a, a reason and a logic. Now, one of the bits of logic might be that the towns exist, the settlements exist with a function. And I, I went through the uh, information that I could find for, for Leicestershire's, and just so you can understand my, my gloriously cack-handed conventions, uh, circle, circles mean defences. These sort of elongated pillows uh, mean there's possibly a mancio, uh, and the sort of shield and spear symbol mean there's sort of military activity, presence of the military uh, found. And what you can see is it's very uneven scatter, you know, so in terms of the military, you know, it's stunningly absent from a large number of them. And a similar thing's true in Northamptonshire. There are one or two sites where some military evidence is present, but there are a lot of other places where there's none. You might find the odd belt buckle that gets gloriously overinterpreted. So, you know, what is the reason for this regularity of spacing? Now, when you start looking at town plans, what I started to see is all towns aren't the same in, in terms of their ground plan. A lot of the towns lie on roads, but expand away from the road. They have quite a big occupation area that goes away from the road. So there's one category of towns that is on a road that still has this substantial settlement area, settlement area going away, the desirable suburb perhaps. There are others where you've got a very linear roadside settlement, these long thin uh, areas where the settlement is linear. So two towns aren't the same, even in terms of their sort of size and layout. In terms of Northamptonshire, the same is true. And we have towns with uh, a layout where we have roads going through and a sort of substantial bulge on the side. This one is Titchmarsh, uh, this one is Ashton near to Oundle, and here we have a, a major road going through and a looping road going off with all the occupation uh, lurking in there. So clearly these towns don't even have a, a common morphology. I've been lucky that for the last sort of 10 to 20 years, I've spent a lot of my working life on this site, Zurchester, where again we have a road coming through on that line, and there's a looping road coming through here. It subsequently got a wall around it um, and developed with suburbs to the west and to the east. But, you know, we do seem to have this main communication route that's quite clearly important, but a lot of the occupation is offset from it. So what's going on? Now, in terms of Urchester, it's quite clear that as a town, uh, it never had a gate on the south wall. And I can say that because when you look here and imagine that curving road coming round, everything is perpendicular to that curving road. There is nothing that will be perpendicular to a north-south 
uh, route entering the town. So clearly, even the walled area of the town was bypassed. How modern and forward thinking was that? You just imagine the petition trying to stop these large four ox carts going through town. Traffic calming. Kettering, however, is a much more linear settlement. So I think, you know, there may be these two types going on, a very linear and ones where there's a sort of suburban bulge. Now, why might this be the case? Well, I think that the army is often slightly overstated because, you know, everybody knows what the Roman army looks like. It's easy to imagine the Roman army. But for most parts of southern England, the Roman army was only around for a decade. You know, it's a fairly short period before they carry on moving north. But the nature of Roman occupation meant there needed to be a continued um, ability to communicate. They couldn't pick up a mobile phone or uh, send a, a, an email. So you have people like this. Poor, lonely buggers riding a horse. Can you imagine? There you are at Dover and somebody hands you a scroll. And suddenly you've been told you've got to go to Housesteads. You know... That's either one very long journey with one horse, or what the Romans did with uh, the landscape is they divided it up with um, changing places and also staying places, mancios, mutatione, where you could change the horse or where the messengers could stay overnight. And I think this regularity of settlement is actually, as much as anything, a reflection of this communication system, the cursus publicus. And what happens is as you have officials and official functions, people accrete to it. If you've got travellers, they might want food, they might want services. If you've got horses, you might want far farriers, you might need stabling, you might need fodder supplies. So I think one of the things we might be looking at, instead of the army being the origin for these towns, the regularity of the distribution, is the spacing reflects how often you'd need to change a horse, before it gets knackered. And the spacing uh, across the whole country is pretty much the same. This is Southern England, as you can see, Kent and Winchester's over there, London. Um, you know, the spacing's the same, you know, throughout the whole, whole of this, this, well, throughout the whole of the empire, as far as one can tell. So I think this cursus publicus is a major aspect of the settlement spacing that we see in the landscape. And I think instead of thinking the army, Think one level down, messengers, uh, because it's not just messengers, it's also people moving goods uh, for the emperor, for the army, people moving services. And the problem archaeologically is identifying these things in, in the archaeological record. Mancios don't have a standard ground plan. It's not like walking into a travel lodge where as soon as you're in there, you recognise the carpet. You know, I spent, I, one hotel chain sent me a statement last week and I spent 31 nights in that hotel chain last year alone. You just get to see carpet of certain styles or curtains. So I think these messengers, and what you'd have is within each settlement, you might have facilities for sleep, facilities for horse changing, facilities for repairs, um, secure yard for goods or wagons or whatever. So you'd have all of these things going on and people would start to accrete to it. And I think some of these linear settlements that we saw, uh, what we might find, these are much more motorway service stations rather than anything else. You know, they're a lower level. They're not really urban. Um, and then the others where you have a proper sort of suburban bulge, I think are much more urban. I think one of the problems we have in archaeology is we use the term town, which has instant modern connotations, and we retrospectively apply it to the archaeological data. Now, in terms of mancios, there are standard low-grade accommodation units. And one of the reasons I got quite interested in Mancios is with Urchester, we had the good fortune of having a complete geophysical survey carried out on the town and the suburbs. And within that, we picked up structures that we think were Mancios. Now, one of the things about this communication network is the Romans were not stupid. Um, it's always one of the things that I'd marvel how quickly after the conquest the Romans knew exactly where to go for the gold reserves and the silver reserves. You know, Somerset, I live, live in Bath at the other end of the Fosse Way. 
Um, and we've got Camerton, and near, not that far away, we've got the Mendip Leadworks. And the Roman military presence there was fairly quick after the conquest because they knew associated with lead was silver. So it's almost as though they had a Bidecker guide as to where to go for resources. And I think the same is true in terms of the broader landscape. With the exception of Silvery Hill, which seems to have surprised the Roman road engineers, you know, they came up to it and then the road has to kink to go around Silvery Hill. It's only been there a few thousand years. Um, most of the time they avoid hard engineering. In Northamptonshire, we're quite lucky. We've got a couple of bridges, these timber bridges. This is the Old Winkle Bridge. And there was another one at Grendon. But the bridges are only over side channels. They're not over the main river. And most of the places where there's a river crossing, the main river valley bottom is over a kilometre wide. And the significance of that is the River Neen, and because there's nobody from the Northampton end here, I can call it the Neen. They stupidly call it the Nen with a silent E. Anyway, um, the Neen um, is, a, is an awful river. When the wind blows from the east, it flows upstream. Uh, there are canals with bigger gradients. But what, they, what the Romans did is they sited their crossings where they could wade across it any time of year. You know, it was an easy place, no hard engineering. So I think one of the things that you want to look at with some of the siting of these places are easy access, easy river crossing and avoidance of engineering. A sign of the dangers of engineering and building bridges. When I worked in Peterborough, one of the things that we excavated was part of the river crossing in Peterborough. And the monastery put this first bridge in at the end of, would you believe it, Bridge Street. And at the end of the first winter, the ice flows took the bridge away and the monastery went bugger. And they rebuilt the bridge and they promptly handed it over to the town for their responsibility. So, you know, the, the trouble with bridges is they can fall down. London Bridge, there's your example. So the Romans avoided building bridges, but focused on fords. Now, Ashton is an interesting Roman town. It sits uh, up on the, the, the sort of main drag coming through. But what you can't see here is that's the village of Ashton. The Roman town excavations were there, but this is the line of the main Roman road coming through. And what it's avoiding is this very sharp meander in the river. They're making sure they don't have to engineer anything. You know, life was all about movement. And, you know, don't go against the grain because it's too much effort. Now, at Urchester, what we have is uh, a town, a uh, Roman town near to Wellingborough. Um, it's had lots of work over the last sort of 30, 40 years. Um, it was visited by a Victorian antiquarian who dug lots of holes in it, uh, the, the Reverend Baker. Uh, who had his friend, Fairless Barber, do primitive geophysics with a hammer and metal spike uh, until he found walls, and then he got people to dig down to expose them. He exposed some of the buildings, bits of the defences, and he dug a big area in the middle. Now, in terms of the site, it is there because of this easy river crossing. And the valley side starts just off this frame here, and the valley side on this side is about here. So you've got this river in quite a wide area. But what they did is they came down right onto the floodplain and they built bits of causeway, bits of raised ground. That's the causeway examined by the Oxford unit back in the 80s from my memory. But it's a long, gentle gradient, perfect for carts and whatever. And the town sits just to its side. So here's the road going down and the town is here with the suburb wandering off that way and another suburb wandering off in that direction. Now, in terms of Urchester, we believe that there is, in the early stage, a fort. There is a slight playing card corner anomaly in the geophysics there, and we think there might have been a short-term fort, short-lived fort controlling the river crossing. And we think that the site then gave way as a, a place for changing horses and for messengers, and developed as a, as a significant settlement over a period of years. Certainly in the first century, there's not that much building works, but by the second and third century, these suburbs have developed quite well. Now, Urchester gets its town defences in the second century, which again to us implies it had some status, some significance uh, in that bigger landscape. And I think that significance is this mansio. It's the fact there is a place for officials to stay and official business uh, to be carried out. 
Now, the town walls go up traditionally, the late second century, and I just thought I'd show you how Urchester sits. Uh, there's Urchester with some of the other towns in the area. There's Water Newton, which I won't talk about. Toaster, uh, you know, both of which are much more substantial towns than Urchester. Then going down the pecking order, of course, Great Casterton. Um, you've got Wilton Lodge and Mansetter um, right down there. So, you know, town defences, not all towns have them. Those towns that do, don't have a standard size. They don't even have a standard shape. I mean, can you imagine which defensive planner thought that something that looks like a wedge of cheese was a good, uh, good design? Um, you know, quite what's going on, we, we don't know when it comes to the town, town walls, but certainly they're a major civic expenditure. Somebody somewhere decided this was worth having and worth spending the money on. And in the case of Urchester, uh, as yet, we haven't managed to put a decent section through them. The only one that we did put through, uh, you'll see in a little while, uh, the defensive wall looked more like a footpath. Now, what's the evidence for status at Urchester? Well, we have statuary. It's the only one of the towns in the Neen Valley that have statues. There's this headless torso of a man. It has a capital. Now, there's capitals also from Titchmarsh, but this, again, implies that there is a building some architectural merit and there is also this tombstone the tombstone to a man called Anicius Saturninus who was a straitor now in terms of the Mancio we think it's lurking here these ranges of little buildings and you can see these little rooms that was what sort of shone out there's actually a big courtyard structure here with lots and lots of little rooms on either side. And that's what we think might be the Mancio. Uh, like a lot of archeological interpretation, when you dig a hole, you find you're wrong. Uh, and as it's a scheduled monument, we haven't had the chance to prove ourselves right or wrong. Uh, but that's certainly morphologically what it looks like. It's a picture of the, the Cataric uh, Mancio, just to give you an idea. It's slightly posher than a travel lodge. Now, what was a straitor? The Straitor was an imperial official, and he was an imperial official who's responsible for purchasing remounts. If you think of this mail system, there you are as the messenger in Dover, heading towards Housesteads. 15 miles and you change your horse. 15 miles, you change your horse. 15 miles, you how many horses are you going to get through in a day? So acquiring this, centrally purchasing this for the state to enable the messenger system to operate, had officials, and the Straitor was one of those officials who was responsible for remounts. Uh, there's one or two inscriptions to Straitors around the empire, but that tombstone is the only one we have uh, in England. Now, with all our towns, there is the awful tendency to have red tile roofs and whitewashed walls. The one joyous thing about archaeology is it shows that a lot of Roman buildings were little more than garden sheds. Uh, some of them simply survive as lines of stones on which sill beams rested and floors rested and they were li little more than a shed so when we start talking about roman buildings whilst it's nice uh, to look at a plan like like this and go oh, yes there's a nice building there nice building there nice building there how many other timber structures will techniques like geophysics not pick up one of the big beefs I always had with Time Team was how they'd always present it as the 100% certainty, oh, it's picked up in the geophysics, or should I say geophys, as if it was made by Corona. Um, but, you know, the, the, the problem with that technique is it only picks up certain things. And in my working life, I've had the experience of uh, geophysics picking up whole Roman sites that don't show in aerial photographs, and vice versa. You know, all of these techniques are limited, sometimes for quite specific reasons. Now, Urchester and most Roman towns have a variety of religious structures. Urchester's quite lucky, we have uh, a pair of shrines down here, there's a circular and a square shrine, and we have a pair of shrines here, a square and a circular shrine. And on my bucket list, I got to dig one of the square ones. Unfortunately, it had also been visited by the antiquarian in the 19th century, and historic England wouldn't let me do any proper digging. I was allowed to dig onto it, to clean it, to photograph it and love it, 
but we couldn't go any deeper. But we've got a lovely square, um, keller, ambulatory wall, courtyard, a structure that if you believe Wheeler, he describes as priest's houses, but it's probably a storeroom. Uh, nice Temenos wall. This is the road going out to the East Gate. One gate pier, there's another gate pier about there. We cleaned it, we found huge numbers of oyster shells all over that courtyard. Either they were offering oysters to the gods, or there was some little oyster seller saying, are you a bit peckish after your prayers, sir? Can I interest you in a pint of oysters? Specially brought up from Hun Stanton. Um, you know, there were huge numbers of oysters. They were obviously consuming them in large, large numbers on this site. What was also very pleasing was within the courtyard, we have this rather nice rectangle of mortar, which almost certainly will have been the base either of an altar or a statue. If you think about li live sacrifice, you know, imagine you've got a goat and a knife. Maybe you don't want to imagine that, but goat and a knife. Would you want to take it into a confined space to slice its throat? Remember, goats have horns. The odds are you'd want to have your sacrifice outside. And, you know, Bath, the big temple complex at Bath, the altar was certainly outside. So I wonder whether these are actually the altars on which things were sacrificed. Unfortunately, because the antiquarian had been through the site, there was nothing left to really locate and find. But, you know, that's probably what the site looked like. Now, English Heritage wanted us to look for the defences. Um, don't archaeologists always work in such lovely locations? Uh, so we put a trench in to look for the north defences on this site, and this was the height of the town wall. The supervisor and I spent ages arguing over whether it was a wall that was robbed out or whether it was a road. Uh, basically what happened is all the big stones had been taken away and all that was left was mortar and rubble. Uh, but we knew where it was, and it was certainly the wall because it cut through a building. If one looks at the geophysics, this is at this end, so the north wall's cut through this building, and this building's on a skew because it was on the angle for this curve of the wall, and at this end we have another building that's cut through by the defences. So when towns decide they're going to do things, there quietly is, quite clearly is that administrative element where somebody can knock on the door and go, sorry Mrs Claudius, your house is in the way and just slice through it. So this is certainly a town, a town in which you would recognise administration, civic authority. At Urchester, we've spent a lot of the time working in the suburbs, and I worked out the other day that we've approximately excavated 2%, which of a suburb is not bad. We have lots of workshops, hearths and, and floor levels, but the preservation is very poor. That's a wall, believe me, trust me. Um, this is where there's a side road going through, and you can see we have these strip buildings flanking it. Um, there's a, a possible well uh, lurking in that corner, and we had a burial ground which spread all over that area. But lots of buildings closely set, but, you know, all very low grade. I've been fortunate that we were able over the last sort of 10 years to engage with lots of amateur volunteers. I started in archaeology when I was at school. Uh, I was going to go off to do geography at university, so I quite like Cristala, uh, but I discovered archaeology had women and alcohol. Uh, and uh, from then on, I was hooked. Archaeology was the thing I wanted to do, and I used to skive off and go and dig for the Oxford unit. Um, but it was that enthusiasm that amateurs had. And we used to work seven days a week. We'd go and, go and work on a Saturday and a Sunday. And so this site, we've engaged with dozens and dozens of amateurs over the years, ranging from school children through to people that's always been on their bucket list. And it's great. And several of them have gone on to get careers in archaeology. So I think one of the things about archaeology is not just what we discover, but also what we can give back, because it is such a great thing to do. Now, no town exists in a vacuum. One of the things I want to say is, you know, any town you look at, whether it's uh, Ashton, Urchester, Toaster, Leicester, it exists in a landscape, a countryside, that has supplied it with the things it needs. People, food, resources. I was very lucky that from the early 1990s, I spent years... Uh, working in the gravel quarries, which sounds like the salt mines, doesn't it? Working in the gravel quarries to the south of Urchester. 
So I have a fairly good understanding of the hinterland of this town. And one of the things that came out <coughs> was, you know, it's a big agricultural landscape populated with small farmsteads that are all very low grade with a smattering of villas that are presumably estate centres controlling and managing them. And so you imagine with all this landscape and agriculture going on, where are these people paying their taxes? Probably in Urchester, the nearest town. And that's one of the functions of towns that, you know, is easy to forget because it's quite invisible. But don't think that payment of taxes is always in money. Sometimes it might have been in kind. In addition, you have large areas of countryside. You can have livestock. Sadly, livestock disappears from the archaeological record, but because we've got this straight or stone, I have been looking for evidence we've got for horses. And um, we have got a number of foal skeletons from excavations around the area. So there is evidence for horse rearing, but there's also this, a well. This well had in it a type of beetle um, that in its larval form infests plantains. And the only way that Mark Robinson could see that this number of beetles would have fallen down the well is if there was a haystack next to it. And what would happen is the larva would be harvested with the hay, brought into the farmyard, haystack built up, nice bit of warmth, beetle larvae goes, oh, these are ideal conditions. And it suddenly comes out as a beetle, runs around the farmyard going, where's the next plantain? Drops down the well and drowns. And so we have evidence from this particular well of haystacks in the vicinity. And why are haystacks so important? They enable you to provide fodder for livestock. And so if you did have things like a, a mancio, and if you did have stabling in the town, you would need large amounts of fodder to feed the horses. Also, in the landscape around Wollaston, uh, around Urchester, we've got several vineyards. It's one of my favourite topics because I spent a very happy six months on and off going around researching vineyards in Britain, travelling around UK vineyards and tasting their wares. It's a tough life as an archaeologist. Um, now, we had evidence for Pastinatio trenching at Wollaston, uh, which is these parallel bedding trenches of vines supported by posts. We had two Pastinatio sets at Wollaston. There were further examples at Grendon. There's been another example found at Earls Barton in the last two or three years. There was another example found on the Sywell Road at Wellingborough. It suggests that the people who lived in the Urchester area must have been absolute winos. They were producing huge amounts of white wine. Now, why is wine such a significant thing? I think it's one of those interesting things, food and drink. Partly, I couldn't live without it, but partly it also marks people out for what they are. People who wanted to be more Roman would consume more Roman things, their food, their drink. Can you think of anything more Roman, more Mediterranean classical than consuming wine? You know, it's one of those things that before the Romans came, the Iron Age upper echelons were importing amphorae to show how well connected they were. If you look at the well in burial, I think it's got five or seven amphorae tucked in the back. No, that's my idea of a wine box. But, you know, these people were consuming wine, I think, to show how Romanized they were. And they understood the process quite well, because what they were doing is they planted the rows sufficiently far apart that the shadow would miss the next row to maximize the conversion of sugar, which meant more alcohol. And you wouldn't need any great resources to produce it. Simply tread the grapes in a half butt, collect the grape juice, stick it in a barrel, let it ferment. Let's face it, English wine, if it was there and available, you drink it. People do. Another thing, firewood, any settlement requires fuel to keep warm, to cook, and to sort of survive. And it's one of those things I'd never even thought of. I drive around Europe a lot, and one morning I came out and smelt wood smoke everywhere, and suddenly realised, you know, this is very much what Roman Britain would have been like. And I looked around, there were large piles of firewood waiting to be used. When I got back, I did various calculations. And Urchester, we reckon it's got 150 households, so a population, say, six or 700. 
Um, and we know what the estimated yield of wood for uh, a hectare is, and we know what the um, consumption in the undeveloped world is. Uh, and so it worked out that Urchester alone would probably need the best part of three square kilometres of woodland just to supply its firewood needs. Now, when you start thinking your countryside, you know, your town starts to exist now in a bigger landscape, a more populated landscape. You know, there will be people producing firewood, bringing it in. You're not going to ship firewood hundreds of miles. You know, you want your firewood close at hand. And you think that's just firewood. That's not wood for construction, for making things like barrels, buckets, carts. You know, it's a lot of wood. A lot of woodland would be needed in that landscape. So sometimes when you have blanks, those blanks are some of the most interesting things. See what the relationship of the blank is uh, to some of the real archaeology. Now, at Urchester, we have that other phenomena of Roman small towns. Dead people. All four of these stars are the locations of cemeteries. They're all traditionally regarded as late Roman, because all of these are that awful group of east-west aligned inhumations laid in a supine position with no grave goods. And so the tradition has them down as fourth century. You know, what happened in the fourth century? Did they have a really dodgy burger place in Urchester? You know, come to Urchester and get salmonella. Anyway, I wonder whether these burial grounds, first of all, we ought to think about their location. This one is on the road that goes out, probably ultimately, to Toaster. This one here is on the road going towards the river crossing. This one here is just off one of the roads that heads down into Bedfordshire. And this one here is on one of the roads going off to Highland Ferrers. So the big question is whether they're temporally different, are they culturally different, or are they just geographically spaced? And one of the things I wonder is, with the number of bodies we've had, and in the 19th century, this cemetery produced hundreds, we are told, um, I wonder whether some of these bodies might actually be post-Roman. I think one of the problems with late Roman and sub-Roman activity is, did they have distinct objects? And the honest answer is probably not. And so a lot of that grey period as the empire is winding down, we might only have the object. So it's the intention and hope that in due course, some of these bodies will be taken away for C14 dating. So we start testing, are our late Romans sub-Romans? I don't mean that in a nasty way. I'll shoot through these. You've all seen dead Romans before. But our cemeteries are interesting because we have children. We have bodies in stone-lined kists. Uh, we have neonates in stone-lined kists. We have uh, children laid out with no stones. Uh, we have this one, which I particularly like. Uh, obviously had a bad headache before or after, uh, where he was trepanned. Uh, you can see the hole taken into the top of his skull. It never healed up. So obviously he didn't get, didn't survive the, 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 the operation. And we've had the inevitable couple of decapitated burials. No Roman cemetery is complete without this. Um, interestingly, having said about the east-west orientation of the bodies, the two decaps we've got are both north-south. So again, they offer us an opportunity to challenge the dating by dating the decapitated burials and de dating some of the east-west burials. And this is that cemetery that we've been working on with the, the volunteers, including doubles. Now, in the mitigation works associated with the recent redevelopment of the site, we carried out lots of work in beautiful locations. This was a former uh, cattle yard, uh, and it had the burial with a pot and some bracelets. And we thought it was a teenager. Uh, we excavated it as best we could. As you can see, it did have a tendency to want to have a bath, but we excavated as best we could. Uh, and when the bones got looked at, it turned out it was an old lady, um, slightly changing the normal perspective. But we've carried out lots of work in the um, areas of the farm, uh, recovering quantities of Roman material, which is unsurprising, it's a Roman town, but also recovering small scraps like this. Uh, of interlaced decorated uh, copper alloy, probably something like a saucer brooch, a Saxon saucer brooch. It's about the size of my little finger, you can see by the scale of the penny. Uh, originally it looked so horrible I thought it was a nasty fourth century coin. 
Now, this is the site we've been working on within the farm complex. The large cemetery is over there, the other cemetery is there, there's another cemetery here, and then the other one is down there. Now, with the excavation being around the farm, the farm had destroyed large parts of the remains, but we had wells right in the middle of roads, wheel ruts, and evidence for a range of activities. One of the things about towns is, it's nice to talk about a town, but you've got to remember they're functioning, living uh, entities. And in terms of Urchester, what we've got is evidence of ironworking, tanning, pottery production, ale production. You know, people had to make a living there. They didn't go, oh, this is a beautiful place to live. Let's retire to Urchester. Um, if you believe the 18th and 19th century sources, they thought that the Roman town that we've been working on was originally the summer retreat where the Romans would move to from Urchester village. So they could take the airs as they blew up the valley. I can tell you, the air blows up the valley in the winter pretty damn sharp. Um, but, you know, they, they just got sort of confused by the fact Urchester is about a mile and a bit away from the Roman remains. Now, what have we got? We've got large amounts of ironstone quarrying. We had wells, and in one of the wells we had evidence in the bone assemblage and other things that suggested there was tanning going on adjacent to it. We have pottery kilns. Please, I know it's not very impressive, but it was a pottery kiln. We did dig two. Uh, this was the less impressive one in terms of survival, but this was the more obvious keyhole shape. Uh, also, malting ovens. Uh, I'm not a, I don't subscribe to them being corn drying ovens. I'm a great believer they're malting ovens. And going on with what I've said about wine, I think in the later Roman period, the consumption of ale would have replaced the consumption of wine. Again, showing that you were North European as opposed to pussy Mediterranean. Now, within the area, we also had further evidence of religious sites. This is part of a circular shrine. And we worked in all weathers and didn't pay them a penny. <laughs> now, we have got some Saxon evidence. There's a post-built structure lurking here. Unfortunately, we didn't find the parallel line. It certainly wasn't that side, but it may have been lost uh, in the gardens there. And we have some nice finds, uh, a glass cosmetic stirrer, uh, part of a a face urn, probably from a cremation. Note the spotty eyebrow and the eye. Uh, when it came out, this case, what the bloody hell's that off? And you know, when you look at something, you're going, oh, it's an eye. <laughs> and we've worked, as I say, with lots of volunteers in all sorts of weather. Uh, this is the lower garden where we had part of more of the suburb with buildings, um, including a very large structure, a multi-room structure. Uh, largely ploughed out in the medieval period, but still there, you can still see trace of the wall line. Um, we had a workshop that was associated with bronze drop Roman road. Unfortunately, the weather in England is not always kind, so periodically we end up abandoning site. Um, that's why it's not exactly a summer destination. This was July. Um, but, you know, it, it's always sun comes back out and you carry on working. Now, in terms of the site at Urchester, we're still working there. There's, I think, planned to be an excavation this coming summer. But one of the biggest things we've been resolving is the road network. One of the problems with the geophysics, it shows you lots of things, but it's making sense of it. This is the edge of the main road heading towards High and Ferrers, which we exposed last year. This is the edge of a road down here, which is probably that road going through. So we've got, this is the road I showed you before, and this is the road I showed you here. And here's four different bits of road, all very unimpressive. But what we're now able to do is put together this rather nice detailed layout of our road network within that bit of the suburb. I have no problem with this being an urban layout. You know, it really is dense occupation. And last summer as well, uh, these glass beads, whether they're late Roman, sub-Roman, or what, we're not quite clear. Now, Ashton, as I'm aware, I'm getting close to that time. Uh, the other Roman town I spent a lot of my life working on in Northamptonshire 
is different to Worcester. It's not a walled town. This is a, a the main road going through it, and it had a series of workshops along it. And it seems like one of the main activities at Ashton was industrial production, blacksmithing. Almost all of these structures have got smithing hards, hammer scale on the floor. There are pottery kilns. There's lots of evidence of industrial activity. I'm not sure that I would essentially want to see this as town. It's different to Urchester, which is a town. It's a, a concentration of people, but you know, it's obviously quite a specialist community with so many of the structures showing evidence of smithing. There's evidence of other industries, and this is a smithing hearth, ale production, and these rather bizarre lined pits that nobody seems quite sure what they're for, and I'm not going to suggest anything. Uh, but clearly lots of industrial activity going on at Ashton. You can see the road going through, the buildings and the yards to either side, it's the road, the buildings and yards. Um, obviously agriculture is another major part of the activity of all these towns as they exploit and, and utilise the landscape around. Now Ashton, what we had is the main road is right over here. The road you saw coming through the settlement comes through there, but that would have hit the river. And when we watched them dredging, as they did in 1983-84, we watched all the dredgings along that section of the river. There was absolutely no sign of any stone coming out. So I think that the ro this road coming along may simply have stopped shy of the river and dogged up to the main road that avoids the meander. Ashton's got a wonderful 4th century cemetery, lots of dead bodies laid out in rows. Um, lots of fun to excavate, and because of the association with the Cairo lead tank, the debate is whether there's Christianity involved. I like to point out that the sun was rising in the east and setting in the west long before Christ was around, and so there's a chance it may still be pagan because the previous favourite religion was the sun, but uh, doesn't always go down well. Now, it's been a bit of a gallop, but what I want to say is is there such a thing as a typical East Midlands Roman town? Now, I apologise, my knowledge of Leicestershire's town is not very good, but certainly looking at your towns, they are similar in lots of ways to the ones in Northamptonshire. You've got regular spacing. You've got evidence of um, industries within them. You've got evidence of uh, activities within them. One or two of them have got defences. Um, the association with the road network is quite clear. Now, you know, it's like chicken and egg, isn't it? Is the road there because the settlement's there? Is the settlement there because the road's there? Uh, and, you know, that, that's always one of, one of the big problems. I think that the interesting thing from an archaeological point of view is because we have this regularity of spacing, when you move slightly away from citing the army as the root cause for the beginnings of urbanisation in Roman Britain, but perhaps think slightly more in terms of this communications network, you know, the cursus publicus, I think, is one of those things that's easily overlooked. But imagine how important it was to be able to get messages, information, commands, orders, news across the empire. The Romans invested huge amounts of effort in establishing the system throughout their lands. So I think that this regularity of spacing is a reflection of how far it would be before a horse ran out of puff. So if you look at towns, think of this other thing. There aren't towns before the Roman conquest. So, you know, there must have been a motivation, there must have been a rationale that came with the Romans to create them. And it can't all be down to a desire to tax. You know, I, th I think that, you know, levels of local administration, you know, are fine and dandy. But I think, you know, sometimes it's too easy to overstate some of the functions. So I think one needs to look at the towns, look at the ground plans. I mean, when I was talking to Peter before I did this, I was asking about the road layouts in the towns, and we know our road layouts in Northamptonshire better than you do. And that's perhaps one of the things looking forward that may be something interesting to research is, is the town extent that you have in Leicestershire something that you can actually work on uh, and um, refine? So perhaps understand the character of urbanisation better. Because clearly, you know, some of the towns are quite large, some of them are quite small. You know, in terms of hectareage, I mean, we've got everything from about 40 hectares, or some are even bigger than that, down to about 10 for these sort of urban complexes. So clearly, all these towns are not going to be the same. So hopefully, we'll not, deal, we'll not dwell on Cristala, but hopefully you'll look at the spacing, 
and you're thinking in terms of you know what is the logic what is the rationale and i think spheres of influence of the towns and the distance a horse can run are probably the key things to, to understand but i don't think there is a typical town and i think one of the problems with archaeology is our good examples are generally the atypical examples but from those atypical examples what we can do is extrapolate and scrutinize some of the other things to see what we can find anyway thank you so much